So what we're going to go over today is some stuff to do with solubility. Okay, Solubility is how well or to what degree one thing dissolves in something else. Usually that something else is water. Okay, Most of the time when we're referring to solubility, we're, we're referring to how well it dissolves in water. Okay, But there are other situations where we might use something else as a dissolving agent. Okay, Anything that is a dissolving agent is usually referred to as a what? Something that dissolves something else starts with S. Uh, well, it would make a solution. You combine two things to make a solution. A solute is the thing being dissolved. Solvent is the thing that does the dissolving, okay? All right, so that has probably been a while since you went over that. I know my, my kid's in grade five and they just came home with that stuff the other day, okay? So maybe it's been a while since you did that, okay? So a solvent is the thing that's doing the dissolving. Solute's the thing getting dissolved. So there's a lot of terminology that we have to remember in regards to solubility. The skills you have to be able to demonstrate in regards to solubility are being able to determine whether or not a compound is soluble in water okay, using the solubility chart that is on the back of your periodic table. All right, so we're going to go over a bunch of terminology, then look at using that solubility chart, okay, and then kind of go from there. Then we're going to talk about the polar nature of water. Okay, water is a polar molecule. It's a type of molecule. We'll talk about what that means in terms of the structure and behavior of water as well. Okay. So some substances dissolve really easily, some don't. Okay, and we've, we've seen that in, in our lives, okay, that some things dissolve easily, salt dissolves easily, sugar dissolves easily, okay, you put them in water and they're gone. Other things like, let's say, butter or oil do not dissolve when you put them in water. So they would be considered to be not soluble or insoluble. Okay. Now, substance is said to be insoluble if it will not dissolve in another substance. So insoluble, okay? That's one key piece of vocabulary that you will need to, to know because that's a word that I will use often okay, in this course. If I say insoluble, it means it won't dissolve. If we get something to form a solid as a result of a reaction, okay? So we didn't have any solids before, but suddenly we react two things together and this powder forms, okay? That powder is called a precipitate. It means that something that was formed in the reaction is not soluble in water. And so as a result, it just turns into a powder and kind of falls out of the solution like rain or snow falls out of the sky, hence the name precipitate. Anything that falls out of something else is precipitating. Everyone follow there. Okay. All right, so a precipitate could look something like this. Okay, so you can see here that you know we've got a solution that's got some stuff in it, but obviously there's some things here that are not soluble and they will eventually collect on the bottom of the test tube as they fall out. Questions so far? Yes, if in, in terms of density, yes. If it was something like oil, then it would float to the top. You can have a precipitate that floats on the top, but most of the time the solid precipitates sink to the bottom. All right, a solution is a mixture, but it's a mixture that has only one visible part. Okay, that is, it is a homogeneous mixture. Okay, and that's what homogenous means, right? Like if you buy milk or uh, something like that, it usually says that it is homogenized because milk that comes straight out of the cow, if you leave it for too long, will separate okay, into like water and cream. Okay? So in order to keep that from happening when you buy the milk in the store, it is homogenized. It goes through a pasteurization process essentially that makes it stay all as one part, okay? make it stay homogenized. Same thing with peanut butter, right? If you buy peanut butter at the grocery store, it's homogenized. If you buy natural peanut butter, you have to stir it every time you use it because the oil will come out and sit on the top, okay, and the rest of the material will be on the bottom. So you always have to mix it before you spread it. Okay, If you have a peanut allergy, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but it's true. Okay, um, They do separate if they're not homogenized. So homogenized means to make it all one part. 
Okay, so this here would be our homogeneous solution or our homogeneous mixture. It's all dissolved. We only see one visible part. Okay, on the other side of this, we could have a heterogeneous mixture. Hetero means more than one. Okay, or many. So this is a heterogeneous mixture. Sometimes we call that a mechanical mixture. You can force it together, but it'll separate again. All right, so if I was um, looking at this, you can see I've got kind of a solution on top that's kind of a orangish color, and then I've got this reddish colored stuff at the bottom. Because there is more than one visible part, it is heterogeneous. A heterogeneous mixture can be separated mechanically. Okay? That's why it's also often called a mechanical mixture. It means you can separate the two parts using their physical properties very easily. Like um, if I had a solid at the bottom, which I do in that mechanical mixture, I could just filter it. Right? I could just put a paper like a coffee filter in there, pour it through. The liquid would go through the filter and the powder would catch and I'd have them separated. Right? If I had iron filings, and sand in a mixture, okay? I could just stick a magnet in there, stir it around, and then pull it out, and I'd have all the iron filings on the magnet and all the sand still in the mixture, in the jar, and I'd have separated them using a simple physical means, right? The only way to separate something that is a homogeneous solution would be to evaporate off the solvent and leave the solute behind, all right? And we, we see that happen if you, you uh, leave a pot boiling on the stove too long. Okay, and it boils away all the water. It forms this stuff on the bottom. You have to get it off the, the stove quickly because if that stuff starts to burn, it will ruin the pan. Okay, so all the stuff that's essentially dissolved in water, the calcium and other things that are in there, okay, they'll come out of the solution. Everyone follow me on that? All right, so definitely got to know, okay, solution, homogeneous, okay, heterogeneous and mechanical mixtures. Those are terms that will come up fairly often. All right, and then other terminology, these are the ones you're probably a little bit more familiar with. A solute is the substance being dissolved. All right, so if I'm making, um, you know, like coffee, putting sugar in the coffee makes sugar the solute and coffee slash water, okay, the solvent because it's doing the dissolving, right? So a solvent is any substance that will dissolve another substance. That's why we often refer to cleaning products as solvents, like Mr. Clean is a solvent. CLR is a solvent. They help dissolve other things, right? A uh, paint thinner okay, is also a solvent. Okay? If you get oil-based paint on your hands, you can't wash that off with soap and water because oil-based paints are not soluble in water. That's why we use them. Okay. If we coat wood with oil-based paint, water can't penetrate. Okay. Uh, but then we get it on our hands, we can't get it off because water can't penetrate. So we use something that it is soluble in, like Varsol, gasoline, okay, things like that, that are other molecules that, or other solutions that can dissolve that stuff. Okay. All right, questions on those two terms? All right, then a precipitate is a solid that's produced in a reaction and will not dissolve in the solution. I'll show you a quick video of one kind of being produced, okay? Uh, so you can kind of see what that um, looks like. We'll do a lab in a couple of weeks where we'll have a few reactions that actually do produce precipitates, some of them brightly colored. You have to ignore like the cheesy violin music or string quartet music or whatever it is. Now, solubility, like we said, the definition of solubility is the degree to which a substance will dissolve in another substance. How much solute can go into a solution before the solution becomes saturated. Saturated is also an important term. If something is saturated, it cannot hold any more of that thing. Okay? Um, so like if I'm making Kool-Aid, okay, I always make a nearly saturated solution because I like my Kool-Aid really, really sweet. Okay, so basically what I do is I, I mix, I make Kool-Aid with hot water. Yeah, it makes it easier. Right, well, then it dissolves really fast, and then I put it in the fridge, and in a couple hours, it's nice and cold, and there's this thin layer of sugar on the bottom. Okay, I know then that I have a saturated solution of Kool-Aid. 
okay? Which means it's nice and sweet now, okay? I've, I've saturated the solution because I've, I've put in more sugar than the cold water can hold, okay? The hot water could hold it all, but the cold water can't. So temperature can actually affect the solubility of a substance. All right, now, as an example, some things should be soluble in water and some things shouldn't. I'm going to file Twinkies as something that shouldn't be soluble in water because they're supposed to be pastry, okay? That is like cake and like frosting and filling and oil and stuff, right? Okay, those are things that shouldn't be soluble in water. The original Twinkie was not soluble in water because the original Twinkie was cake and filling and natural ingredients like eggs okay, and oil and, and like lard and stuff like that and sugar. Um, the modern Twinkie is soluble in water okay, because the original Twinkie was made of natural ingredients and as a result didn't last very long on the shelves of stores because they would spoil because they were made of natural ingredients. You don't make a lot of money if a lot of your product spoils before it's purchased. So they substituted a lot of artificial ingredients for the natural ingredients because then that would make those Twinkies last longer. They now have a shelf life of like a couple of years okay, on the shelf, which is a little bit disturbing for something you could eat. Okay? Um, and I'm not one of those, oh, I got to eat all natural stuff because I'm like one of the worst for eating crap. Okay, um, But when they designed the modern Twinkie, okay, they took out things like eggs. Okay? Now, eggs was the reason Twinkies were yellow. The yolk of the egg is what gave the pastry, the cake, the yellow color. Right? Without the egg, it looks like the color of drywall paste. Okay? It's just gray. And people didn't want to buy Twinkies that were gray because they didn't look appetizing. So to replace the yellow, they added well, not food coloring. Food coloring would be a lot better for you than what they added. They added yellow dye number five. Yellow dye number five is a carcinogen. It causes cancer. Okay. Now, if you only eat a Twinkie once in a while, no big deal. There's not that much yellow dye number five in a Twinkie. You eat five, six Twinkies a day. Wait, first off, you got some problems. Okay, shouldn't eat that many Twinkies in a day. But okay, where you eat a lot of Twinkies, that's a lot of yellow dye number five. In fact, yellow dye number five is banned by the Food and Drug Administrations of basically every country in the European Union. Okay, um, but in North America, it's still allowed in small amounts in certain food products. Okay, it's not very good for you. Um, they replaced a lot of the like the lard and things like that with other types of of kind of oily substances. They're not really real oils, so they are now more soluble in water than previous. Real whipped cream is not soluble in water, but the artificial stuff like Cool Whip is, and that's what a lot of the filling in a modern Twinkie is made of. So. You, we've essentially taken something natural, made it into something artificial, which if you put in a glass of water, after a while will dissolve. So if you had to go on a liquid diet, like you broke your jaw, you could still have Twinkies. Just put them in water, and after a little while, you'd be able to drink it. <laughs> It'd be kind of gross, but you could do it. Okay? Yeah. Well, yeah, you could gum it, I suppose. I mean, it is pretty soft, but okay, if you had your jaw wired shut, which is what happens when you break your jaw, okay, you have to eat everything through a straw. Steak's not all that good through a straw. Okay. Yeah, you can blend it, but it's difficult. And blend. Yeah, <laughs> people usually get to that. Mr. Dickey's son broke his jaw last year and he had the same problem. He, uh, he had to liquefy a lot of things in order to consume them. So yeah, hey, it's tough. All right, on the back of your periodic table, you'll find this chart. So if everyone can take out their periodic table, we're gonna go to this chart, okay? And I'm gonna teach you how to use it. So a solubility chart is used to determine whether a substance is going to be soluble in water or not. We usually use it if we have a chemical reaction that produces a precipitate and we want to figure out what that precipitate is. All right, because we would usually have two options. There'd be two products and we'd have to figure out which one of them is still dissolved and which one has become this precipitate. Okay, so here's what we do. We look at the compound itself and 
we find the parts of it in this chart. So if I was dealing with something simple like sodium chloride, okay, I would look for the non-metal, which is chlorine, in this top row because the things in this top row are generally negatively charged, so they're the non-metals. Okay, so I find here's the column that has chlorine in it. Okay, and then I look down into these two rows. The first row is the things that chlorine is going to be soluble with as a compound. It says very soluble with most things. Thanks a lot, solubility chart. Most is really helpful. Okay, so it's soluble with most things. So what I'd have to do then is go down and look at the slightly or not soluble row and say, okay, it's not soluble with copper, it's not soluble with silver, mercury, uh, mercury two, mercury two, or lead. Well, since sodium's not listed down here, sodium must be part of most. So sodium chloride is soluble in water. Everybody follow? Okay. If I had, uh, let's say, silver chloride instead, okay, it says soluble with most, but silver is down here, so silver chloride is not soluble. If, if I tried to put it in water, it wouldn't dissolve. Or if it was produced in a reaction, it would form a precipitate, a powder that would fall out of the solution. All right, does that sort of make sense how that works? Okay, we look for the non-metal in the top row and then see where the metal is. If it's in the, the, the middle row, it's soluble. If it's in the bottom row, it's not soluble. Okay, all right, let's have you guys try, let's try these two first, okay? Figure out whether iron sulfide would be soluble or not. I'll give you a minute on that. All right, so let's look up iron sulfide here. So sulfur is right here. Okay, so I'm going to look in this column here. Uh, it says that sul sulfur is soluble with hydrogen, sodium, potassium, ammonium, lithium, magnesium, and calcium. Is iron listed there? Then iron's part of most, and this is not soluble, so it would be a precipitate. Okay, and with sodium hydroxide, same idea. I find hydroxide, it's right here. It's soluble with hydrogen and Here's sodium, it's actually specifically listed. So sodium hydroxide is soluble in water. All right, okay. I got a list here of I think eight, okay. I just want you to write these ones down and write beside them S or NS, okay. Soluble or not soluble. And uh, then we'll go through them together here in a minute. All right, let's have a look at these. So for number one, we got lithium fluoride. So I go across on the top here, I find fluorine. Okay, it says it's soluble with most things, but lithium does appear in the not soluble row. Okay, so lithium fluoride is not soluble. All right, number two is uh, sodium sulfate. Okay, sulfate is right here. It says it's soluble with most things, but not with these things. But sodium is not listed there, so sodium sulfate is soluble. Okay, for ammonium nitrate, okay, uh, almost all nitrates are soluble. So when we see nitrate, it's right here in this first column. It says soluble with most things except for these incredibly rare complex ions that I can't even tell you the name of. All right, so sodium, or sorry, uh, ammonium nitrate is highly soluble. Okay, uh, for number four, we've done that one already, silver chloride. Okay, it was my example from up here, but chlorine is in the third column, soluble with most, but we clearly see that, so, that silver is listed here in the not soluble row. Uh, then we've got lead to iodide. So iodine is here with chlorine and bromine, soluble with most things, but lead 2 plus is listed here in the not soluble row. Was that to be lead 4, that would be soluble. Okay, Lead 4 iodide would be soluble. Okay, um, and then we have hydrogen sulfide for number 6. All right, so we look up sulfide, it's right here, soluble with hydrogen, so that one would be a soluble compound. Uh, we have potassium phosphate for number seven. All right, phosphate is here below carbonate. Okay, it's soluble with hydrogen, sodium, and potassium, so that would be a soluble one. And then we have um, mercury two chloride. So chloride is right here, soluble with most things, but we clearly see that mercury two plus is down in the not soluble row. Okay, questions on how the solubility chart works? Okay. You will definitely be required to use that on your reactions lab, which is a few weeks away yet, but yeah, you'll be using it there. And I always ask on the unit exam and usually in quizzes as well, here's a reaction, which of the products of this reaction would be soluble? You'd look at the products and go to this chart and figure out which one. Okay. 
All right, questions on the solubility chart? Yeah. All right, we got to look at now water and why it's special. Okay, basically, if you've got um, any rule, water always seems to kind of be the exception to it. Like most things as a solid take up less space than their liquid counterparts. But we know that's not true for water. Okay, we know that ice is actually greater in volume than liquid water. Water expands when it freezes. Most things do not do that. Okay, uh, and you know that if you've ever, you know, tried, you know, frozen a water bottle or something like that, it always pops the bottom out. Okay, and then it doesn't stand right after that because okay? you've rounded off the bottom. So water does expand, and part of that is because it is a polar molecule. Okay, we also know that you can fill a glass above full. As long as you don't try to go too far above full, okay, you can get that kind of bubble or meniscus worth of water, that surface tension, okay, that sits on top and allows you to do that. Okay, that's also something that happens because of water's polar nature. All right, so we're going to talk about why water's polar and how that allows it to do some of those weird things that we see it do. All right. Now, in a molecular compound, we said that the electrons get shared between the two non-metals. Okay, well, in water, we've got hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is usually a metal, but can occasionally behave as a non-metal. And in this case, it's actually behaving as a non-metal. So when it's in water, hydrogen and oxygen share the electrons, but they don't share them equally. Okay, so it's not a perfectly equal sharing. Um, if you look on your um, periodic table, okay, you'll see that there's a, a number on there called electronegativity. Okay, and it is not on my periodic table, okay, but it is on yours. Okay, the uh, electronegativity for oxygen is 3.4. It's the number that's just above the O on your periodic table. Okay, the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.2. Okay, electronegativity describes how strongly an atom holds on to electrons. Oxygen holds on to electrons more strongly than hydrogen does. Okay, so instead of oxygen and hydrogen sharing these electrons equally, okay, meaning they would kind of go in like a nice circle around both of them like that, they actually end up doing this instead. Okay? Because they're more attracted to oxygen or they hold on to oxygen harder, okay? the orbit of those electrons looks more like this. Okay? And they spend way more time closer to oxygen than they do to hydrogen. So what that means is, and a water molecule, which kind of looks like Mickey Mouse, okay? ends up being positive on the top and negative on the bottom because electrons hang out down here way more than they hang out at the top. Okay, that's why we call it polar. It actually has like a positive pole and a negative pole. Okay, so that's why it's called polar. It has different charges at either end of the molecule. Okay, now that allows water to do some strange things. Okay, because what do we know about opposites? They attract each other. So if another water molecule comes along, its negative end will be attracted to the positive end of other water molecules. So much so that they'll form a weak bond called a hydrogen bond. It's called a hydrogen bond because hydrogen gets it started. Okay, Hydrogen bonds aren't very strong. They break easily, but they also reform very easily. And it's these hydrogen bonds that allow us to see things like surface tension in water. Okay, you've probably seen like on the side of a really cold glass that water droplets will stick to it, okay, until they get kind of really big and then they'll slide down the side of the glass. Okay, but when they're small, they stick to the side. Okay, that's because the, there's hydrogen bonds that are forming between the water and the glass. Okay, and they're actually holding the droplet of water right there and keeping it from falling down. All right, so like we said, the sharing's not equal. Some elements are more electronegative, so I talked about that already. Okay, so there's it's asymmetrical in, in how the, the electrons go. They spend more time in one part of the molecule than they do in others. Okay, so we start seeing this. One water molecule can hydrogen bond to four others. 
right? So one water molecule will have its negative end bonded to the to one of the hydrogens, another one will bond to the other hydrogen, and then other water molecules can come up from the bottom and bond to the negative end here on the oxygen atoms at the bottom, okay? And you can get this kind of a, a bonding thing going on, okay? And that's where you'll see surface tension okay, forming, things like that. Does surface tension, does it break easily? Like, can you disrupt it? Like, if you touched it, would it be gone? Yeah, it disrupts very, very easily, all right? So um, that said, it can do some pretty amazing things. Anybody ever skip a rock off on the water? Okay, right? You throw a flat rock and it bounces along the water. Okay, the reason for that, surface tension. Okay, the water molecules are bonded to each other hard enough that if a rock hits it and it's not like, you know, coming straight in, it'll actually bounce right off. Okay. until it gets too slow and then of course it'll break the surface tension and fall through right but it's way easier to skip a rock on a lake than it is on a river because what's always happening to the surface tension in moving water it's always breaking yeah you don't have uh, nearly as much surface tension on a moving body of water as you do on a still body okay so on the ocean it's also hard to skip a rock on the ocean because there's always waves and the surface tension is always being broken Okay, but on a nice still body of water, it's quite easy to skip a rock, provided you have the right shape. If you try and skip a jagged rock, it doesn't usually work as well as a nice smooth one. Okay, everyone okay with that? All right. Okay, so the, the water molecule has kind of a right angle to it, okay, because of where the, the hydrogens are. They're both positive, so they kind of repel each other a little bit, push each other away, okay? And that gives us the two positive ends and the two negative ends Okay, on the water molecule where other water where other water molecules can bond to it or other polar molecules can bond to it. Okay? So we see essentially two behaviors of water. We see one behavior called cohesion. Okay? And cohesion is water to water hydrogen bonding. Okay. And we also see something called adhesion. Okay. And that's water to some other molecule. Okay. That's another water, another, sorry, a water molecule hydrogen bonding to another molecule, not water. Okay, so it's adhesion if two things that are not alike are sticking together. It's cohesion if it's things that are alike sticking together. Okay, um, questions so far on that? Okay, what the polar and hydrogen stuff is? So when we have liquid water, okay, liquid water, if we could see the water molecules, would look like this. Okay, at about four degrees Celsius is where water is most dense. So it's most dense as a liquid. Okay, when it freezes, the water molecules try to get closer together, but because there's these positives and negatives, the negatives get too close and they create this moment of repulsion, okay? This moment of kind of almost an elastic bouncing off of each other. And it's at that instant that water usually crystallizes, okay? Which is why water expands when it freezes, okay? The water molecules repel and form a crystalline structure that has them farther apart than when they're in their liquid form. Because they're farther apart, ice is less dense than water is. And so it floats on it. Okay. Most solids are more dense than their liquid counterpart. So if I was to, let's say, um, take some mercury and like freeze it and then drop the mercury cube into liquid mercury, it would fall to the bottom. Okay. Ice does not fall to the bottom when you put it in water. It's less dense, so it floats. If that wasn't the case, lots of things on Earth would be very, very different. Okay. Lakes would freeze from the bottom up, which would mean nothing would survive winter in a lake. Okay, Because water free lakes freeze from the top down, the ice actually insulates the water underneath against the outside cold. Right? The, water, the ice can get pretty thick in some cases, but lakes almost never freeze all the way to the bottom. 
Everyone kind of follow on that? It'd be a lot different if ice was more dense than water and it sank, right? Then lakes would freeze from the bottom up. And when you put ice cubes in your drink, they would sink to the bottom, okay? which would be weird because we're all just really used to having ice cubes float okay, when we put them in something else. All right, so these hydrogen bonds happen when, okay, hydrogen, the positive end of water or some other polar molecule, bonds to another polar water molecule. So most of the time, that's cohesion, the bonding of water to water. But it could also be adhesion, the bonding of water to another polar molecule, like this one, which is ammonia. Okay? Ammonia is the stuff that's in Windex. So if you ever smelt what Windex or glass cleaner smells like, that's ammonia. That's what it smells like. Everybody all right with that? Okay, it is the polar nature of water that allows plants to transport water from their roots to their leaves, along with a couple of other things. But if it wasn't for water being polar, it would be impossible for plants to transport water from their roots to the leaves. They rely on this hydrogen bonding to occur inside the stem. So if I could you know, blow up what the inside of a stem looked like, this is what I would see. And inside these little tubes, okay, a stem is made up of millions upon millions of microscopic tubes. Okay? We don't see them. When we cut a piece of wood, they're so small we can't see them, but they're there. They're like tiny, tiny straws. And the water can go up these straws. But what it does is it'll form hydrogen bonds with the inside of the tube and with other water molecules. So essentially, you've got some water molecules acting as an anchor against the side of the tube and holding on to other water molecules down below. Those hydrogen bonds are strong enough because the tubes are tiny. And we're only talking about maybe, you know, let's say 100 water molecules in any given part of it, right? If, it, if the tubes are really big, it wouldn't work because there'd be too much water in the middle that would be unsupported and it would fall. The hydrogen bonds wouldn't be strong enough and they would break and it would fall back down the tube. But because the tubes are incredibly small, they're microscopic, Okay. The hydrogen bonds are strong enough to hold the water in the tubes and keep it from falling back down. So it ends up being like a barrel of monkeys. Anyone ever play with a barrel of monkeys when they were a kid? Like the little plastic monkeys whose arms and arms hook together? Ooh, it's a generation gap. Okay. All right. Anyway, if you had like a link or a chain, for example, okay, that's what the water would be like inside of the tree trunk. Okay. There'd be they'd be linked together. If I pull on the top link in the chain, I pull all the rest of the chain up, okay? And that's what happens in the tree. As water evaporates from the leaves, it pulls on all the other water molecules all the way down to the roots. So if one leaves the tree, it pulls all the rest up, okay? They stay together because of these hydrogen bonds. If water wasn't polar, there would be no way to defy gravity and move the water up the plant. Okay. So we see some cohesion. Okay, So you can see here, there's cohesion here between the two water molecules, and there's adhesion here, a hydrogen bond between the water molecule and the inside of the tree. Okay, That is an example that is going to come up time and time again in this course. It'll come up here in chemistry when we talk about the polar nature of water, and it's going to come up again in biology when we talk about how plants transport materials within them. Okay, so this is one of those themes that'll come up over and over again. So is this something you should study and know? Yeah, if it's in two different units, it's kind of important. Okay, and I can't remember the last time I didn't ask about it on a final exam as well. Okay, so make sure you know water's polar, cohesion, adhesion, hydrogen bonds, those are crucial concepts. Okay, um, so the surface tension is also, like we said before, an example of the hydrogen bonds being strong enough to hold the, the water together and not allow it to flow. Okay, so we see that if we fill a glass a little higher than full, okay, you can also apparently balance a paper clip on it if you drop it on there like light enough and you have the edges, okay, like the sharp ends pointed up. If you don't, those sharp ends will break the surface tension. They'll disrupt the hydrogen bonds and they'll sink to the bottom. Apparently you can do that. I spent like two hours trying to do it and never succeeded. Okay, um, it's two hours of my life I'll never get back. Uh, but yeah, okay, it's yeah, it's all it's it's apparently possible, but I've never been able to accomplish it. Okay, we also see sometimes that water forms kind of big beads on certain surfaces, especially on the leaves of plants, because the leaves of plants are covered in a waxy layer that prevents water from penetrating them. 
It also prevents water from escaping from the inside, which is what it's for, okay? But we see water kind of bead up like that on the surface of the leaf. You can also see that if someone has just waxed their car or truck, okay, the water beads and then kind of runs off as opposed to sits on the paint and is allowed to penetrate and deteriorate the paint. So if you wax your vehicle, the paint will last longer because water can't penetrate through the paint and into the metal where it would start the rusting process. And so waxing your vehicle would prevent water from penetrating. Okay. It would form, however, a hydrogen bond with the wax, and that bead won't run off until it gets too big for the hydrogen bonds to hold it, or if you start driving and there's enough wind force to push the droplets off. Okay. One way or another, you've got to break those hydrogen bonds somehow. Okay. So adhesion, cohesion, okay, definitely two things we need to know about. Okay. And of course, there's some animals that make use of this. Okay, uh, if we're talking about like the Jesus lizard, the one that can run across like small bodies of water, okay, it goes really, really fast. If you've ever seen one in slow motion, like the legs are just like doing this circular motion, okay, um, but it's utilizing that surface tension of the water. If it slows down, it'll fall in, okay, but that usually it goes fast enough, okay, that it can actually push on the water, not penetrate through the surface tension and get across. Small bugs do that all the time. You often see bugs just floating on the water. Okay. They're, again, sitting in that surface film, and they're not heavy enough to break the surface tension, so they sit there. Okay. Can you make them drown? Yeah, yeah just throw a rock anywhere near them. Okay. Breaks the surface tension, and down they go. All right. So that's if you're like really cruel and wanting to test out science and surface tension. Okay. If something is sitting on the water, break the surface tension near it, and it'll sink. Okay. Unless, of course, it's buoyant enough. Some things are buoyant enough okay, that they would continue to stay on the water anyway. A water strider like this isn't. Okay. It'll just put its legs out really far apart and sit on the surface tension. Okay, questions on any of those? Right. Okay, that takes us to what I wanted to cover for today. Next week. So on Monday, we're going to start our lab design. Okay, Tuesday we'll, uh, either we're in the lab or Wednesday we're in the lab, I can't remember now. Okay, but we will be doing that first lab next week. Okay, so make sure that you have all the proper equipment for going into the lab. Okay, that is that you have proper footwear and that you have a hair tie if you have long hair. Okay, that you uh, don't wear something that's loose that could fall into things. Okay, when we're working in the lab that day. Okay, make sure you come properly equipped for that stuff.